We're going to talk about Revelation. Uh, this is the uh, be, uh, bringing the future into focus. And again, it's a hard book. It's a tough book. I want to give you some review because it's so voluminous and we've gone so far. We're doing a chapter a night. So I want to give you some review. Uh, remember the rhyme? How many of you remember the rhyme? From eight. Uh, let's, see, let's start. Revelation chapter 1. We shall see the sun. Very good. That's a picture of Christ. And Jesus is, is shown. And he's inspecting candlesticks. It's a last days type of movement. It's a different Christ. It's not the suffering Messiah. This is the conquering Messiah. This is someone who's coming whose eyes are flame as fire. There's a sharp sword representing the word of God coming out of his mouth. His feet are as burnished brass that have been, been in a fire. He has a golden girdle around him like the high priest. And he's inspecting these, these candles which represent the church. So Revelation chapter 2. It's exactly what he does. He inspects the church. Revelation chapter 3. We know that those churches were seven churches. Again, this is a review in, in Asia Minor. On the poster route, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Patmos. I'm going fast because it's a review. Every saved person, what? True. Very good. Every saved person truly seeks a perfected life. A little acronym to help you understand it. So John writes to it from the island of Patmos. Let me show you a beautiful island, by the way. The island of Patmos right around here. He's in exile. Domitian has thrown him into a boiling oil, and he's according to tradition, and trying to kill him. And he came out. He's on Patmos, cracking rocks, so Rome can pave the way to, the, to Rome. Uh, actually, those, those roads, Paul will travel with the gospel. Perfect design from God. And so he writes letters of a vision that he has in Revelation to the seven churches of Asia Minor. They're actual churches. They're churches historically. The Christian church has gone through seven phases uh, historically. Then there are also conditions of churches. You can go to a church that's an Ephesian church or Pergamus church and it's conditions of us as individuals. So that's chapter 2 and 3. Revelation chapter 4. The elders sit 20 and 4. John's, in, John's projected into a heavenly scene uh, remember, this is all centering around the final act of God towards mankind before he sets up his own kingdom. So he's, he's pushed to a heavenly scene and he sees 24 elders with thrones on crown, uh, crowns in their heads and they're around the throne, the emerald throne of God. And of course, the, the, the uh, object here is God sitting on that throne. Again, that's an anthropomorphic statement. Anthropomorphism means attributing human qualities to God. God does not, God the Father does not have human qualities. He's a light that no man can approach. We view him as an old man with hair, with gray hair because it shows us wisdom, but God is not an old man with gray hair, God the Father. He's a light that no man can approach. The Bible says in 1 Timothy that uh, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And so uh, he, sits on, he sits on this emerald throne and it pulsates. The word throne there is iris and uh, it means just like your eye, it pulsates. Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covers. He's in front of that throne. He has, he has uh, gems in his body. He's reflecting those gems and the light spreading out. And he's the most beautiful thing God's ever created until he decided he wanted to step up to that throne. Back to that throne. So John's shown that throne. And he's shown the, at least the, the visage of this, of this throne sitter. And he does recognize a hand. Again, an anthropomorphic thing that has a scroll in it. Uh, that scroll is held out. And there's a question that's given out to all of eternity. Who is able to loose the seals of the scroll. This is what this whole revelation is about. This is the final chapter of God's dealing with mankind and sin. He's going to put an end to sin. And this is the eternal question. When will God do this? When will he avenge us? Well, this is what John sees. How many are following us so far? So, uh, I want to make this a story so you can understand the whole story before we get to it instead of just studying chapters. So, this hand is, is out there and this hand has a scroll in it and the scroll has seven seals on it and it's written on the inside and on the, uh, on the back side. And we see this scroll in other places. Ezekiel talks about it. Daniel said he saw it open. So Daniel must have been transported even where John was when he saw the scroll open, which we're going to in the, in the future in our, in our study. So he sees it and there's things written there. Daniel's told not to write, and, and so is Ezekiel, not to write some of, down some of the things that he sees because he sees some last judgments. And so uh, we see the scroll written and this question goes out. Who is able to open this book? And John says, when he's up there in the vision, he says, I cried because nobody was found able. And so we get to Revelation chapter Chapter 5. A wounded lamb alive is? Is the one that's able. This is the scene. The 24 elders, the throne of God, the scroll written, and a, a wounded lamb alive. The lion lamb is able to open the scroll. The lion uh, being two symbols of Jesus 
two opposite symbols of Jesus, uh, but talks about his two divisions of his ministry. He's the Lion of the tribe of Judah, which is a conquering lion. Jesus has not come back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah yet. He's not come back as a conquering lion. He came as a suffering Messiah, a suffering lion. That's why in Isaiah and in other parts of Scripture, you see some Scriptures, 300 Old Testament Scriptures about the suffering Messiah. There's about 335 Old Testament Scriptures about the conquering Messiah. Jesus did not fulfill the conquering Messiah Scriptures yet. Only the suffering Messiah. So he's found worthy and so he starts to open the books. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, come. So this is the invitation, Revelation 6, 1, to come see what's going on. Now I told you there's going to be 21 judgments, uh, 7, 7, and 7, 7 seal judgments, the ones he breaks open, which are the mild judgments, believe it or not, 7 trumpet judgments, and then 7 bowl or vile judgments, which are very, very uh, I don't want to use a pun, but they're very vile. They're very, they're very, uh, very uh, hard to hear. So we get to Revelation chapter 6, and your rhyme is? Four horsemen, fire and brimstone mix. So you just, got, you just got some of the seals by saying that. So we know that the first four seals are the white horse, uh, which is the conquered, to go forth conquering, the red horse, which is war, the black horse, which is famine, and the colorous or green horse, which is death, and hell follows him. So that's the first four seals. The fifth seal are the souls under the, under the altar in heaven. There is an altar in heaven. When we get to Revelation chapter 19, you'll know that there's a tabernacle in heaven. There's an altar. There's an ark of the covenant in heaven. All the pattern that was given to Moses and, uh, and, the, and the ones that built it, Bezalel, which is the one that was commanded to build the, the uh, ark of the covenant, were direct exact dimensions from the ark of the covenant in heaven and so and same thing with the temple in heaven so we see that this is the fifth seal the sixth one is uh, the cosmic disturbances Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 to 14 so those are the first six seals if you could see them in a chart form it would be like this he had a bow given to a uh, uh, crown went to conquering I believe it's the word of God the white horse red horse a uh, peace removed violence break out from his sword war third seal, black horse, uh, balanced scales, huge inflation, oil, wine, and, spa and spared, that's famine. Fourth seal, pale horse, death has Hades with him, hell, qu a quarter of the earth is killed with sword, famine, death, and beast. Fifth seal, a uh, martyr's crowd under the altar, martyr's crowd, how long? Not until the number of your brethren will also be killed, which will happen in tribulation. Sixth seal, celestial signs, earthquakes, sun darkens, moon turns red, stars fall, sky recedes like a scroll. Seventh seal is the, that says rapture, uh, I don't believe that, that's a mid, that's a mid, uh, uh, I want to put this here to show you that's a mid-tribulation rapture thought. Some people believe this is when the rapture will happen. I want you to know that. I believe the rapture is going to happen right here. This is silence in heaven, and it has nothing to do with the rapture, although that shows it, but that's, if you're talking about full uh, study of Revelation, that's where some people get a mid-tribulation rapture. They think that silence is the rapture. I think the rapture will be anything but silent. How many are with me? So, but those, the silence is the, is, the, uh, is the seal that's there. So, if you see those, let me give it to you this way, which we believe. White horse, word of God. Red horse, war. Black horse, famine. Pale horse, pestilence, quarter of mankind, dies. Fifth horse, uh, f excuse me, fifth seal, martyrdom, great tribulation. Sixth seal, heavenly signs. And then we have silence in heaven. You'll notice that we end our seals, our sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6, and we don't pick up the seventh seal to chapter 8. And so we have a chapter in there that doesn't fit chronologically, which is chapter 7. Anybody remember the, the rhyme? Revelation chapter 7. Two multitudes bound for heaven. It's a, it's a parenthetical chapter. It's a chapter that gives you a further emphasis of the truth. It is not in chronological order. This is why so many people get messed up with Revelation. This is something that happens to further explain something. Uh, Cheryl, is, Cheryl, who is, who is um, Wilder's grandmother, is my wife. I don't need to put who is Wilder's, Wilder's grandmother in there to tell you Cheryl's my wife. That's a, that's a parenthesis, and so this is adding to the story. That's what this will do in Revelation chapter 7. It's called an interclary chapter, or a parenthetical chapter. Chapter 7 is that way, chapter 10 is that way, chapter 12, 13, 14, 17, 18. They further explain the text. They're not in chronological order, chronological order. they just further explain the text. How many are with me? It's a review, that's why I'm going fast. So. Just understand, I'll be giving you this so that you understand the progress of it. What we're seeing here with all these, all these seals so far, we're seeing judgments on the earth. Now, why would God want to show a judgment? By the way, this study of Revelation is not popular in America today. Very few places uh, talk about it because we're pretty comfortable in America. We don't like anything to upset our comfort. How many are with us? That doesn't mean you can't learn the truth. Listen, how many of you know that Jesus comforts us? How many of you know he's going to give you peace? 
but he doesn't want you to stick your head in the ground and not think anything's going to happen. How many are with me? So there's things that are going on. So this is why we're given Revelation. Trust me, it ends up, ends up better than it starts. And I can tell you that. So we see that there's two great, two multitudes, chapter 7 says. There's 144,000 who are, who are numbered in their foreheads. These are male virgin Jews. You'll see them standing in Mount Zion. It's a revival in Israel. Paul told us it's going to happen. It's happening right now, by the way. Uh, there are Messianic Jews all over Israel. I have a friend who wrote a book called Why Me? He, was up in, he uh, lived up in uh, Yaakov Dunkami, lived up in the northern part of Israel. That book has sold more copies and actually gives it away. It's one of the highly, most highly read books in Israel. It's going everywhere and there are young people getting saved because the orthodox religion doesn't work for them. Could you imagine a young person telling him he's going to grow up, he's going to make his hair grow really long, he's going to have curls, he's going to wear dark clothes, and he's going to go. He's going to go to a temple every day, and he's going to just open, just con continually recite the Torah over and over again. How many think that that's going to really kind of fly with a young guy, a young person? How about if you tell a young woman uh, that's a Jew that she's got to go and marry one of these guys and shave her head and shave her eyebrows and live in a commune type of setting? It doesn't work. Their their religion doesn't work for them. The orthodoxy of their religion doesn't work. Some people opt out to a more to a more um, a more easy role, a reformed role, but they're rejected by the Orthodox. So we're seeing Christianity really push out into Israel. It's going to happen even more so when we see Revelation. Then we have the great palm-bearing multitude. These are probably the martyrs. And uh, so these are the two multitudes that John sees in heaven. He sees people there, which tells us the rapture has, has happened, and he's seeing that. Then we get to Revelation chapter 8. Remember, anybody remember this one? One third of life affected by Wormwood's fate. This is the trumpet angels. These are the shofar angels blowing the trumpet. I brought my trumpet. So I'm going to blow it for you. We don't know exactly how they blew it. It could be it was a call to war. It was a call to assemble the troops, but this is the shofar. It's made from an ibex horn, and uh, basically this comes from Israel, and they would have silver and gold on it. Uh, they would wrap it, and these horns, this just came in for me. I bought it when I was there last March. And so that was the shofar. That's the thing that these trumpet angels are going to be blowing. It's also the same thing that's going to, going to herald the rapture. And when the trumpet angels blow these trumpets, these are the next set of judgments. So we have the first one. It kind of, it's kind of hard to remember them all. But we have the first one. They're blowing their trumpets. Then we have the first one, which is hail and fire mixed with blood. Now, this sounds so symbolic, but I'm going to bring it to a head tonight and tell you what I really feel this is. And I'm going to show you what it is. It could only be, it could only be one and possibly two things, and I'll show you what it is, some of these, some of these judgments. Then the Bible says the second uh, trumpet is a great giant mountain burning with fire. It goes into the sea, and a third of the sea becomes blood. Um, it's either this, actually, uh, seismic uh, occurrences, or this, nuclear war. And if we want to talk about anything today that's going to fit Revelation that was not possible in 96 AD, it's nuclear war. Nuclear war, we've been on the verge for it for a long time. Those 13 days in October of 1962 when Kennedys told everybody to go home and kiss their kids and hug them, they thought they were 13 days away from total annihilation. And so nuclear war is a definite fact. Uh, Kim Jong-un's grandfather was one of the worst mass killers on the planet. He killed 21 million of his own people. And so uh, we know that that heritage is there from that rogue nation. We also know China is, is nuclear capable. Pakistan is nuclear capable. We know that India is nuclear capable. We know that Saudi Arabia is nuclear capable. We know that Israel is nuclear capable. We know that Iran is working, thanks to our president, on being nuclear capable. And Russia is nuclear capable. So there's plenty of nuclear arms that are out there that can destroy or at least give damage. And by the way, it won't destroy the earth. It's a misnomer to say that a nuclear weaponry will wipe out the earth. It won't. It would be more like one third of the earth, which is exactly what scripture talks about. So this isn't heartwarming. I know that. It's not something that we, we can go home and say, oh, isn't it a great study tonight because we talked about nuclear warfare and everybody dying. But that's not the issue tonight. The issue is that we have to understand that something's being, being, being justified, something being rectified, and you have to trust God in that rectification. So the third trumpet is definitely seismic. It's, a, it's called Wormwood. 
And it's definitely one of those NEOs, a near-Earth object that comes through the atmosphere, it smashes into the planet, and we know that the fresh water is turned bitter, which means it has to happen on land somewhere. The fourth trumpet is a third of the sun, is what we studied. A third of the sun and the moon, the stars are, are darkened, and daylight is darkened by a third. Now, how do I explain that? Well, if you had nuclear winter, nuclear fallout, you're going to have nuclear winter. You're going to have ash. You're going to have things coming up into the atmosphere. It's going to darken the atmosphere. And so it's a very easy fix when you say it. God, John is seeing a nuclear event, I believe. I believe he's seeing all that war. He's seeing death. He's seeing famine that occurs from it. He's seeing a whole bunch of things that are coming. And he sees the end of mankind. He sees doomsday. And uh, it's, listen, God does not have to punish sin. All he has to do is let sin do its own job. That's all he has to do. He doesn't have to punish anything. Listen, you, if you want to smoke and you want to... You want to uh, say, I'm going to smoke, you're going to get cancer probably, or you're going to get some type of problem with, it, with smoking. It's a direct effect. If you want to do something sexually licentious, you may get a disease. And so there's causes and effects. How many understand that? So God doesn't really have to say he's judging. He's allowing that thing to go on. Sin judges itself. You with me tonight? All right, so we're watching this happen. So the se seven sealed judgments are the ones that were, are passed, and we're on the seven trumpets. So we're getting close to tonight. So the first trumpet, remember, seals, trumpets, bowls. First trumpet, green grass, and third of the trees burnt up. I'm just going over what I just did. Second, third of the sea becomes blood. Third of the ship's sea life destroyed. And by the way, that would happen. If you had any type of cataclysm where something, where something fell into the waters, you're calling, talking about tsunamis. You're talking about a lot of different things that's going to wreak havoc on it. Third of the waters turn bitter. Third one, third of sun, moon, and stars don't shine. So John's giving you a first century vocabulary. Has no word for nuclear. Has no word for, for nuclear winter. Has no word for fallout. Has no word for some of the things that we do now know with our technology. So uh, if I would show you this in a form of how these revelation events take place and where we are right now, bringing you up to snuff, here we are. First six seals. We have that interlude, that space, chapter seven. Then we have the chapter eight. We have the hail, hail asteroid, wormwood, darkness. All of this obviously either cosmic or nuclear and we're right here. We're in between the fourth and the fifth seal. And that's where we're going tonight. So how many of you are up to snuff of where we're at? How many of you I went too fast for? Well, every week we're going to do that as much as I could possibly do it. So let me just tell you that. It may get a little bit different as we go along. So we're in Revelation chapter 9. An open pit, Euphrates angels unwind. An open pit, Euphrates angels unwind. Let me ask a question before we go any further. Aren't you glad you're saved? Aren't you glad that you know God? Listen, this is not something to scare people. This was told to us to let us realize it. And listen, God is love. We know that. God would have it that none should perish. There's every opportunity for people to come to the Lord today. Every opportunity for them to just... And that doesn't mean you have to join this or do that or do this. I was just talking to somebody before service. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven that you're going to be surprised that they're there. There's probably going to be a lot of people not in heaven that you're going to be surprised that they're not there. It's not about what we profess outwardly. That's great. It's about what we do with Christ in our hearts. And so that's extremely important. So, yes, God is love. Yes, He cares about us. But God also has to justify sin. He did ours on the cross, and He has to justify sin. Or he, was, he would not be a fair God. He has to do that. So He's given every chance. And also, in Revelation, there'll be opportunities to get saved, and I'll share that with you in a bit. So we're at Revelation chapter 9. So let's begin. Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And the fifth angel sounded, this is the trumpet judgments, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given, now by the way, that word star is astarte, and it actually means, uh, it actually means a luminous one, a bright one. Uh, also, there's another word for it that's used interchangeably. It's called a luciferus, which is, we get our word lucifer from. And our word Luke means bright, shining one. So he sees a shining star. Sometimes angels were called stars. This is an angel. Star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him, so that's how we know it's somebody, was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as a smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Again, a lot of symbolism. John's telling us something like this. So, the key to the abyss. What is the abyss? Well, I mean, I, we have a tendency in, in America to just stay away from hell or anything to do with hell. But the Bible is extremely literal. That is the abyss. That's at least a depiction of it. It's a, it's a deep, deep cavernous spot that, uh, that is burning. Old Testament theologians and some uh, modern day theologians believe that the abyss and hell is in the center of the earth. The center of the earth burns at 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. We will never get to the center of the earth. There was an article that came out a couple years ago 
about five, six years ago, a lot of prophecy teachers were teaching it that they had a, they were drilling a hole in Siberia and they got so far down and they heard screams coming from, from hell. That was, and as soon as I heard it, I said, that's a lie. First of all, you cannot go through the penetrate the earth. We have nothing that will take us eight miles down. That's our crust. Nothing will take us down that far. Secondly, um, I believe that it was, it was sent by somebody who was an atheist to try to discredit Christians. You know why? Because Christians are gullible. They're very vulnerable. They'll, they'll believe something that seems Christian-wise to back them up. I do not want to be that way. I don't want to give you something that's sliding to make it fit. I want to take scripture and tell you what scripture says. There's an abyss. Do I believe it's the center of the earth? There are so many scriptures that talk to us about the center of the earth and about the, the underworld and about it being there. There's a, Bible, there's a Bible verse in Revelation that says the smoke of their torment will rise up forever. The lowest spot on earth is the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is lower than any place you go. If I take you to the Dead Sea, you can, it's, it burns constantly. There's, it's as hot as anything. Uh, but you'll never get a suntan. You're two atmospheres down, you won't get a suntan. You won't get burned. As soon as you sweat, which I do a lot down there, it'll dry up to salt right on you. The Dead Sea is volcanic, it's seismic, there's been eruptions, Sodom and Gomorrah were there, there's volcanic ash everywhere, there's volcanic rocks. Some people believe that that is the spot where it's talking about that the smoke of the torment will rise up forever. So Israel is actually a depiction of heaven and hell. If you get to the top, Israel's on a pitch geographically and, top, topo and topographically. Here are the mountains of Lebanon, which are beautiful. The snows of Lebanon it almost represents heaven, and Psalm tells us it does. Here is the Dead Sea, the lowest spot on earth. And right in the middle is Jerusalem. It kind of sums up where we are. You know, we're not in heaven yet. We're not in hell yet. We're to make that decision. So, so we see that the bottomless pit has some real credibility. And again, if you told this to the world, they'd probably laugh at you. But the Bible talks about the underworld quite a bit. The underworld. We have, before Christ ascended, there was called Sheol. You had Haiti. And Sheol was, one part was Abraham's bosom. One part was was hell. There was a great gulf fix between them. You can read Jesus' parable. When, when Lazarus died, uh, he, not the Lazarus that was uh, his friend, but another Lazarus who was a beggar. He had a rich man that was in hell. Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. They call back and forth so they have consciousness. They understand it. But when Jesus, when Jesus died, the Bible says he, he led captivity captive. So he preached in Abraham's bosom and emptied out Abraham's bosom. They were seen on earth. John tells us that some of the dead were seen after Jesus' resurrection. There was a limited rapture that was there. So then it just became hell. So wicked dead go to hell. It's the exact names of the Old Testament Sheol. All of the underworld are the netherworld. Then we have the deep. It's usually in the, in the New Testament also translated the abyss, which we just read, or the bottomless pits in Luke and Romans. It's a separate place for fallen angels and possibly some of Earth's more wicked men. So there are punishment levels in hell. Uh, Dante wrote the Inferno back in the 1500s, got excommunicated from the Catholic Church because he showed nine rings of hell. And he showed that the, that the worst things you did on the planet, the further down you went. And uh, basically on the bottom level, he put traitors. Benedict Arnold would be there. Judas would be there. Uh, he put traitors. He puts murderers in the second level up. And so he has different degrees of, of punishment. And I do believe that's scripture. Because the Bible says you'll be punished with many lashes, many stripes, some with few. Just like I believe there's degrees of rewards in heaven, I believe there's degrees of, of, hell, of punishment in hell. How many of you believe that uh, Hitler should be further down in hell than somebody else? I do, and, I, and that's what Scripture says. Many lashes, few lashes. So this is the underworld. Now, let me give you a little bit more of the underworld. We know that hell, Old Testament she Sheol, is now, is now Hades. All unsaved, Satan, demons, and fallen angels go there. The amazing thing about this is the Bible says that it was not created for man. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. That's why God gives us an option of not going to hell, obviously. And uh, then there's the, it's nearly full right now, I believe, hell. The bottomless pit is full. There are inhabitants in the bottomless pit that I'll tell you about, Scripture says, that have never seen the light of day. These are angels that left their first estate, Jude tells us, and they've been chained in darkness since they left, since they fell. You will see in Revelation chapter 9 that they'll be loosed. Four of them will be loosed. These are the hierarchies. Then there's the lake of fire. Every single thing is eventually going to go into the lake of fire. All of Hades and all of the people that are, all of the beings that are in, not people, but beings that are in the bottomless pit or the well pit of the abyss, they'll all be cast into the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment. Have you ever heard of the great white throne judgment? You and I are not judged at the great white throne judgment. If you've confessed Christ, if you're here tonight and you're believing in Jesus, you're not going to the great white throne judgment. Every wicked person and every wicked demon will go to the white throne judgment. And so I've heard preachers talk about us being to the judgment. You will not get judged. Your sin got judged when Christ died on the cross for you. So, again, all scripture. Here you go. Ephesians tells us this. And here's the thing that, that most people in the world don't get. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, this is currently right now, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me stop here and give you a little bit of an insight. How many of you know that the Middle East is messed up? How many of the Middle East has been messed up for a long time? Most of the major wars happen from the Middle East. Um, the Bible says way back in Daniel, about 2500 BC, that there's a prince of the power of the air over the Middle East. It says, and Daniel was taken to Babylon, and he was captive. And he was praying to God, and he said his prayers were resisted 21 days by the prince of the powers of the air, which was the, the prince over Persia, which is where Babylon was at that time. It's now Iraq. And so he was resisted. Michael came, he said, he saw spiritual warfare. Michael came and fought him who resisted his prayers. Let me suggest to you that the reason why we still have some of the troubles in that area is there's still demonic oppression over that area and there's a demonic influence over that area. Now some people would say, Pastor, you believe in demonic influences? Listen, I do believe in demonic influences. I've been involved in, in, in places, in things that are exorcisms that you, I couldn't even explain it to you because you wouldn't even believe it. Uh, but my family knows about it. So yes, it happens. Now does, de does the devil want to show himself like that? Of course he doesn't. Uh, all he wants to do is have people just go along their way and not believe in God. That's fine for him. But you go to a third world country, which my children have been to, and I promise you, they've seen demon possession in third world countries, and it was very evident. Uh, third world countries also have great, great uh, revivals for God. So we're in America. America, all you have to do is get secular to be away from God. Somebody say yes. That's all you got to do. You be secular. Think for yourself. Be materialistic. Do all those things that it's all, all, a meology, and Satan pretty much has you. If you, don't, if you don't do anything for God, if you don't believe in God, he has you. And so uh, America is kind of numbed because we're a, uh, we're a third world country, or we're not a third world country, but third world countries will see it very, very evidently. But this means that you do fight. So the Bible says this, if you're arguing again with your wife, it's not you. How many of you love your wives and your husbands? So it's not you arguing with them. There's, there's, uh, there's uh, evil influences that can take over all of us. That's hard for us to admit, isn't it? How, let me prove it to you. Jesus is with his disciples up in Caesarea, uh, Philippi, the northernmost parts of, of Israel where the Jordan River starts. Peter says, they're looking around, he's in, a, he's, in a, he's in a Roman temple that's there, believe it or not. There's little niches in the temple with all these gods inside of it because everybody believed that their god was the source of water. That the water was the source of life. So Jesus looks at the disciples when he's living and he says, who do men say that I am? And some says, one of the disciples says, John the Baptist come back from the dead. Another one says, Elijah. He said, but who do you say I am? And Peter steps up and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's looking at all these gods, and Peter declares Jesus God. First one ever to declare him God. And Jesus says to Peter, Flesh and blood has not revealed that to you, but my Father which is heaven. The next thing that happens, now so Peter, how many of you are getting Peter pretty high on the score for spirituality here? Raise your hand. He's got an A. The very next thing that happens is Jesus says he's going to Jerusalem to die. And Peter says, I will not let you go to Jerusalem to die. You're going to stay here. We're not going to, go, we're not going to do that. And Jesus says to the one who just declares he's the Son of God, S get thee behind me, Satan. He calls Peter Satan. Now, how many of you would like Jesus to call you Satan? <laughs> I don't think I'd like that. He wasn't telling him that he was Satan. He was telling him he's been evil influenced. He recognized that it wasn't necessarily Peter. His thoughts were wrong because he wasn't thinking godly. He was thinking in an evil way. How many of you get that? So we can be used that way, every one of us. That's why the Bible says when you get in a fight with your husband or your wife, and hope you don't, you, don't, you may, may need to think about it. It may not be your husband or your wife. It may be some, something, some thought you entertain that's really not a godly thought. It may be something that you entertain that's really not something that's conducive to your relationship. So that's what this is talking about. Uh, this is the... Uh, this is the, the demonic activity. And here's how, the enemy, here's how the enemy gets people. You have three types of demonic activity from Ephesians 6. 12. You have oppression, to burden harshly, to weigh heavily upon the mind and spirit. Mental illness is, is, is a physiological thing. People used to put people who are mentally ill in hospitals and say they had demons. That's, that's a physiology to, to it. But you can't discredit the, the, amount, the fact that there's a lot of de demonic activity that happens. You can't, I've been around a lot of demonic, uh, demonic uh, mentally, demonically oppressed people. Oppression means to take your thumb and to press down on something. That's oppression. We get oppressed a lot. Depression is an oppression from the enemy. Depression is not from God. If you've ever been depressed, that's not from God, that's from the enemy. It's an oppression. He's pressing you down. He doesn't want you to rise to who you are. Then you have obsession. That's preoccupation with a fixed idea or unwanted feeling to occupy the mind excessively. Obsession. Uh, uh, when somebody's obsessed, 
Obviously, they're going to play out their obsession. If it's, a, if it's a harmless obsession, you have no problem. But if it's not a harmless obsession, then you're going to see something come out that's pretty wicked. Obsession, I've seen Christians obsessed with the devil. I've seen Christians realize that this stuff is there and that's all they talk about. That's not what we're supposed to talk about. We, we could talk about the good news. Come on, somebody say amen. They get oppressed with it. They follow every, every, everything that happens uh, with exorcisms. They want to be involved in this. They want to be involved. And basically, they don't realize you're, you're being obsessed by the thing that you actually are, are talking about. Then there's possession. Satan can only possess one person at a time. He's not, he's not, uh, all, he's not all everywhere at the same time, omniscient. Or excuse me, omnipresent. He, his demons can possess people, but trust me, demon possession is not as easy as you think it is. Uh, demon possession is inviting things into your life. Satanists, have, a lot of them are demon possessed. Some of them are not. But when you invite him into your life, obviously he's going to go where he's invited. So you have the, those are the three activities that are there. So we're going to watch when the Holy Spirit is here, which we have right now in the Age of Grace. These activities are in some type of, uh, some type of low. But once the Holy Spirit's taken out, these activities are going to swarm. They're going to go everywhere on the planet. And that's what we're watching. So John sees something. He sees the demonic activities. And then he reads this. And he says this. And there came out of the, of the pit, sm smoke out of the pit, the smoke locust. What is that? Oh, there came out of the smoke, excuse me, locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. It was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead, the 144,000. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented, these are people on the planet, five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. So obviously it's very, very descriptive, very symbolic. If it would give you a symbolic type of look at it, he's seeing these demon, these locust men. Now that is obviously something that, that is a, a, a symbolic description. So these locusts upon the earth, he's telling us that they're demonic. He's telling us that they're, they're doing something to men. They're hurting them. Uh, men are looking to die because it's so tough and they're not dying. So what exactly is he telling us about? Well, let me continue on and tell you what he's going to do. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. On their heads were as it were crowns like gold. Their faces were the faces of men. They had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. They had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Now, a lot of people tried to describe this, but we're talking about John with no knowledge of vocabulary of our day. So what about if he was describing this? There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions have power on the earth. Now, that's an Apache helicopter. And basically, that's an Apache helicopter. And that is a person, that's a pilot with a gold helmet on. Apache helicopter pilots, a lot of them wear gold helmets. And by the way, there's female Apache helicopter pilots. So what if he's describing some type of modern weaponry? What is he describing? The stings that come from both the front and the back, the stinger tails. By the way, when they fire their missiles, there's a, there's a trail of fire that goes out the back also. What if he's describing these locusts like men in full helmet gear? What would you call that if you're in the first century? I'd find some animal that looked like that or some insect. How many are with me tonight? So the scenarios that we're given, even though they seem so massive, he's giving you a spiritual undergirding of it. This is satanically inspired, but these are, these are weaponries he's, he's describing, I believe. He's describing a, a, a spiritual side to it because it's based out of, out of demonic activity. He's describing an all-out war for five months, and obviously people want to die because the war is, is devastating everything. If you look at some of the annals of when the Blitzkrieg was happening in, in, uh, from Germany to uh, to England, they were firing V5, V2 rockets over the English Channel. There's, there's accounts of people who are in England who are saying, I just wish I could die because the rockets weren't hitting them, but everything was gone. So this is the type of thing he's describing. How many, okay, it, does it have to work that way? No, but listen, this is the only scenario I see that fits this. So let me give you a little bit more. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Now he's telling you about spiritual demonic activity. These people that are starting this war are not inspired by God. They're not inspired by land. They're not inspired by money. They're inspired by a demonic activity. They're inspired by evil. How many of you think that what was done in Orlando was done, was, had no evil associated with it? How many believe there was evil associated with it? Do you think that man was a Christian? He was not. He was Islamic. 
let me tell you something about Islam. I'm not against Islamics. Listen to this. Every Islamic is not a terrorist, but every terrorist is Islamic. You have to understand that. Islam, in its, in its, in its radical stage, is a very demonic religion. It's a religion that looks for a total world conquest. It wants to kill no matter what. It's a civilization takeover. A caliphate is nothing more than that. You will go into an area, forget about the borders, you kill everybody that's not like you, you or you drive them out so you can establish your caliphate. That's demonically inspired. Satan hates mankind. He hates saved mankind and he hates unsaved mankind because we have a potential of serving God. Even the unsaved. How many of you are unsaved? So you have a potential of serving God. Now you're saved. So the thing is, he hates all men. And if, you, if Satan wants to inspire somebody, he's going to inspire somebody, and he's going he's to possess somebody personally that could do the most damage to mankind. Let me suggest to you that Satan has possessed a lot of men in the past, and I'll show you some of the murderers as we get a little bit further. So it says, And the sixth angel sounded, or at the sixth trumpet, and I heard a voice out from uh, the four horns of the golden altar. Remember I told you there's an altar in heaven, there's a golden altar, there's a menorah, there's, a, there's a, Revelation 19 tells us a temple. Before God sank to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, now watch this, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. So the Bible tells us that in the great river Euphrates, these are the ones I told you that left not their first estate, there are four angels. Now he gives us a specific river, the Euphrates. And that's amazing to me because right now the Euphrates is in in the midst of the warfare of the Middle East. It's in the midst of everything you can possibly imagine. It is the, it is the center right now of contention around, uh, around Mosul, which by the way, Mosul, how many of you have heard the name Mosul? If you want to know the scriptural name for it? Nineveh. That's Nineveh. And so Nineveh is Mosul. So we see this thing, this age-old battle that's always been there. So uh, how many are you still with me tonight? So it says, loose the four angels, okay? So we're talking about another demonic-inspired activity. Again, stay away from thinking that these are, there, there's definitely angels that, in the spirit world, but stay away from thinking that these are something people are going to see. They're not going to see them. It's going to be an influence on them, even though they're, they're, they're there. How many of you believe you have a guardian, guardian angel? So where's your guardian angel right now? Where is he? He's right here. He's, so there's a spirit world happening, if you believe that, among us while we're living in our, in our world. So that's what John's seeing. He's seeing the spirit world mesh with the physical world, and he's seeing the inspiration behind it. How many are getting this tonight? So as we see it, let me tell you what, Luke, what uh, Jude says. Jude 1, six says this, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitations when they first fell, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. I get chills when I think about this. There's some angels, probably hierarchy angels, that fell. The Bible says that Lucifer took a third of the stars of heaven, Revelation says, which is a third of the angels, with him when he fell. Some of them, most of them, almost all of them are demons. But some of them are reserved right now under the Euphrates River. They are, they are bound in darkness. They've been bound ever since they fell. At least four of them. And so this is the, they've never been released on man. We know that the Bible says that uh, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We know that he has influence. How many of you believe that Satan has influence in our world? How many believe that there's such a thing as demons? Yeah. Now again, be cautious. You don't want to be a demon chaser because basically you're living in a different dimension than demons. But that doesn't mean that they don't exist. They do. John's giving us this interaction back and forth. A rare insight. Okay, so he says they're in the Euphrates. This is the cradle of civilization. Euphrates River is right here, 1,800 miles. I want to show you some of the nations that are around the Euphrates River and see if this prophecy doesn't match up to what you're seeing today. Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. I mean, you can't get any more specific than that. If I, if I showed this to you 30 years ago, none of this would be, would be relevant. If I showed it to you um, 50 years ago, none of it would be relevant. But today, this is in the center of your news. This is where all the problems are happening right now. If war breaks out, World War III breaks out on the planet, that's where it's going to happen. And basically, it's going to be satanically inspired, uh, obviously. Men are going to be satanically inspired. So how many are getting it today? Okay, there you go. That's the point of contention, the Euphrates River. And right to the left of the Euphrates River, by the way, we see that there is Israel. Tiny Israel right here. So we're watching this sixth angel sound this... Uh, this uh, this announcement. Then we get to um, Revelation 9, 15. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. So now we have a specific time of this war that's going to be very, very caustic. It's going to take a lot of lives. And the number of the army of horsemen 
We're 200,000, thousand, and I heard a number of them. That's two million. So now he's putting another set of, of uh, things coming in, and uh, basically, most scholars believe that this is China. China also coming into that area. China has a has a um, rail uh, has a highway that they've built from interior China all the way to the Euphrates River, and it's all actually all the way to the end of China, and it stops at the end of China. So China is a major player in our world today. He later on will call them the kings of the east. Uh, so we see that in, Re when Revelation chapter, in chapter 9, verse, uh, verse um, 17 is there, we see that there's something that's happening afoot with another set of, of, uh, of players in this problem. And basically, uh, 2004, the CIA fact book claimed that China has more than 200 million uh, fit for military men for an army. That's the largest army, standing army on the planet. And they didn't have it until 2004. Uh, the Bible says they have breastplates of fire. Yeah, I think it was right there, did it not? There we go. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and then that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Now remember, if this is some type of army, uh, somebody said, well, the, you're not going to have horses. Well, of course you're not. This is going to be, that's the only thing he uses to describe it, because it's the only thing he knows. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a scenario. Did John see advanced 21st century uh, weaponry, like maybe this? Or this? Breastplates, by the way, breastplates of fire. Uh, could that be the red uniforms of China? This is one of China. I'm about to show you a couple of Chinese tanks. There's one with the stinging in the front. There's one that has a, an actual head on it. And here's a, here's a Chinese concept for a new tank that will, take up, that will be able to travel faster than other tanks. Did John see that? Did he call that a horse? Did he see the red Chinese? We don't know. But we know that he's describing something that's fierce that's coming that way. So again, how many of you are starting to see this put together just a little bit? He's seeing a war. He's seeing a massive war. Can we even picture or imagine a world like that? It's our worst case scenario times a thousand. Then Revelation 19, 18, and we're getting to the good part tonight, so just hang in there. By these three was the third part of men killed. So he's told you about the things that happened. Warfare, the, obviously the, scor the, the scorpions, the tails of them, the, the uh, serpents. It says, by the fire, the smoke, the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. And obviously if they're showing it, throwing any type of artillery, that's what's going to happen. For the power is in their mouth and in their tails. If you know anything about a tank, it can, it can turn its turret and hit both sides. For their tails were like unto serpents. They had heads, and with them they do hurt. And that obviously comes from that top, that turret. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. That's grace. That means that they could still repent. But these men are not repenting. That they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of the murderers or of their sorceries nor of their fornication nor of their thefts. So now he talks about the big four. He tells us about, I call them the big four. Mankind is trying to hold on to everything he's accumulated, which has become his gods. We live in a very materialistic world. We live in a world where if you follow the money, that's where something makes sense. You want to follow world politics? Follow the money. You want to find out who's going to get elected? Follow the money. It used to be your son can grow up and be a president. Now you've got to have billions, millions of dollars to be an elected president. You want to talk about nations and why they, why they destroy other nations? Russia's going into the Crimea so it can get oil, so it can sell it out on the, on the black market. Russia's going into Afghanistan, and they're going into Syria so that they can be part of the Middle East and the treasures of the It's all about money. We're in the Middle East. We train Western, Western, nation, Western leaders in the Middle East, like Bashar al-Assad, who wears a suit, who's, who's an alawite that's, that's uh, ruling around Muslims because he's an American, he's an American uh, puppet. Now he's turned he's turned rogue and so we're trying to get rid of him the Shah of Iran we gave him his own printing press he was printing hundred dollar bills while his people were starving to death in Iran no wonder why they captured all of our all of our, our people so money is the whole thing money is hurt people the love of money is the root of all evil not money itself but the love how many people have killed people over money over inheritances this is what God's telling us there's murders that are there people are murdering each other how many of you believe that we're living in a 21st century that we should not murder each other anymore how many believe that especially wars I mean how in the world can we talk about it? Listen, you want to talk about Satan and about some of the things? Murders, sorceries, that's the use of supernatural power over people in false religions and cults, fornication, sexual licentiousness, thefts, stealing of property, provision, and, and persons. And listen, I am not a prejudiced person, but God talks about the right sexual orientation in Scripture. He talks about it. You can talk about political correctness all you want, but God has a right way and a wrong way. Somebody say amen. So how does that go unanswered? Well, let me tell you about murderers first. 
These are the three biggest murderers our world has ever seen. Joseph Stalin, 62 million people he murdered in wars and his own people in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Uh, we, we know that People's Republic of China, that is the second biggest murderer, Mao Zedong. And then we know that Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler actually murdered 21 million. We talk about 6 million Jews. That's not talking about how many Germans laid down their lives in World War II or how many allies were killed in World War II. He's credited with 21 million. You can keep going down the list. You can go down to Saddam Hussein. You can go down to Kim Jong-un's grandfather. You can go down to, uh, you can go down to uh, Osama bin Laden. It's murderer after murderer. After Bashar al-Assad has killed 100,000 of his own people. 100,000 of his own people. Ili Amin, you can see it, it doesn't seem man cannot rule himself. Right. We are in a democracy which is the best government on the planet but let me tell you something. If you don't think there's going to be some riots in the conventions, there's going to be riots because we're breaking down. Things are breaking down. And so something has to give and this is what it is. God's seen all these murders. He's seen all this travesty. What would you do if you were God? I'll tell you what I would do. I wouldn't wait another second. Yet he's waiting. That's his grace. He's waiting. But he's not going to wait forever. You still with me tonight? So we know that this is Revelation chapter 9. Let me give you a little summation tonight as we go on. kind of looks like God has a special case against the types of sins, murder, sorcery, fornication, and thefts. And you know what he does. You know why? They all affect others and can be perpetrated upon the innocent. One of the things God hates is sin that goes upon the innocent. He hates it. Uh, think about those babies. I have my little grandson here. A sin against an innocent is the worst sin you could possibly commit. And that's why God hates it. You know, I don't want to, I'm not prejudiced about anybody. It's horrible what happened in, in Orlando. Those people were innocent of that war. Understand that. They were innocent of the war. It shouldn't have been perpetrated against them. Uh, we're all sinners, but it shouldn't have been per perpetrated against them. If you ever heard Christians say, well, you know, they were gay, they were trans, that, they were human beings that should never have had something going against them, and especially to be killed like that. And so basically, God hates that type of sin. He hates that mass murder, uh, mass murdering sin. And I'm going to give you another one I'm going to throw in. Uh, how many remember Hillary Clinton's? Uh, it wasn't a secretary, but he was one of the, uh, what was his name that was found uh, with a suicide outside the Capitol? Vince Foster. Vince Foster. So questionable what happened there. God forbid if Hillary Clinton had anything to do with the murder, which by the way, our government has done more things than you could possibly imagine. If he's done anything to do with that murder, God hates that. He hates something that's a murder of an innocent. And so basically, and that innocent means they really didn't deserve, who deserves to be murdered? No one. And so God hates it. He has to justify it. So we know this. Let me sum up tonight. They all affect others, those, those sins. And God will always come to the aid of the innocent. Let me give you a couple more names. Mao Zedong of China, 49 million. Joseph Stalin, 62 million. Adolf Hitler, 21 million. Leopold II of the Congo, 18 million. Hideki Tojo of Japan, 10 million. Pol Pot of Cambodia, 5.7 million. Kim Tu Sung of North Korea, uh, Kim Jong-un's grandfather, 2.5 million. So we have murder after murder. And remember, you and I are innocent today. We're really innocent because we have, because we have the blood of the spotless lamb of God on our side. So far, we've seen the first seven seal judgments and the first six trumpet judgments. You don't want to miss what I'm about to tell you. So we've seen the first seven seals and the first six trumpets. So we're 13 judgments into Revelation, eight or left. Let me sum it up for you tonight. The book of Revelation gives us a long-range view of what is about to happen on planet Earth. It's like a sight of a gun barrel enhanced by a scope placed on top of it. It brings the target closer and allows us to zero in on the final, exam and the final chapters of man's existence as we know it. But we must eventually take our eye away from the scope. You've got to go home, so do I. And look at our present world as it is and understand that we must live our lives today walking by faith if we're ever going to meet the Lord at the end of our journey. The future hope is portrayed in relationship language. It is not a stranger who stands on the boundaries of all human history, but it's the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who stood at Galilee, at Jordan, in the hill of Golgotha, near Jerusalem. It'll make all, this, all the difference for us. Whether a believer living in the suffocating atmosphere of the first century Pergamos, or one who lives on the hard streets of the 21st century, we have a hope that begins in the fact that Jesus Christ reigns at the end of all times, just as he reigned at the beginning and in the middle. We, in fact, live our lives presently because of this living hope in Jesus Christ, who encompasses the past, the present, in the future in his personality. It's not ideology, it's not theology, it's not mythology. It's the living Christ who pulls us from the past as we remember his costly grace, who pushes us through the present by the Holy Spirit and who overshadows us in the future as we look toward the finality of truth, of justice, of love, 
and of faith. These are the promises that help us envision our future. These are the blessings that bring us to the next level of glory and wisdom. In Revelation, we see the difference between light and dark. We see the difference between good and evil. We see the difference between heaven and hell. In contrast to hell, something far greater is waiting for us. And I couldn't do it justice if I gave you any picture of it. That's, a, that's our heavenly home. Our world is a mess today. I've been watching it for several, for 30 years. It's a mess. It's not getting any better. And uh, just because we have insulated lives, thank God we do. Thank God of his protection. You and I could be people who are living in Afghanistan, or we could be Christians in Iran who are being pushed away from our homes or, or threatened with death. We have the grace of God. We have so much being in America. Our world's a mess. Jesus said in Matthew 24 that when you see it, when you see these things coming to pass, to look up for your redemption draws nigh. I want to leave you with a couple things tonight. My future, my unknown future is in the hands of the all-knowing God. Whether that has to do with the world at war or whether it has to do with the problems that I'm facing today. Next thing, I know who holds tomorrow. There used to be a song. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand. But I know who holds tomorrow and I know who holds my hand. And he holds my hand. The Bible says in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And lastly, I want to tell you this. God says don't worry about your future. He's in, he is the author of your story and he's already written the final chapter. You and I have a destiny with God. You know, I can't change our world. I can't do it. I heard one preacher say, well, you know, the church will change the world. It's called uh, millennial thinking. We will not change the world. The church is, is a narrow way. Jesus said that there's not many that get saved. He says few are the way that get saved. He, he tells us that there's a time that we have to trust him more than we've ever trusted him with our children, with our grandchildren, with our very lives. And I really believe the seriousness of that t is tonight. Now, tonight I'm going to go home. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to have fun with my family. I'm going to enjoy them tomorrow and the next day. That doesn't mean that my mind doesn't think about what's happening because I know what's happening. It's one of the reasons why I'm doing this, one of the reasons why I'm teaching this, one of the reasons why you're here, so we can, have an, so we can be alerted to the fact that this is the last days. And these are the times when we should rise up. These are the times when we should love like we've never loved before. Times when we should trust God like we never trusted God before. These are the times you should make up with some family member that you've never made up before that is wrong, especially if they come to you. This is the time that we should do those things because this is the hour and this is the time that the most is expected out of us. So can I pray with you tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just thank you and praise you tonight, Lord God. And Lord, what a tough book it is to study. But Lord, you told us it so we'd have an understanding. You told us it, Lord. We didn't need to know it, but you told it to us so that we would be able to love those that are around us, Lord God. Treasure the time we have, Lord. Lord, and do things for your cause and your glory. Help us not to grumble, Lord God. Help us to realize that you are already in our future. You already have it under control. We trust you tonight, Lord God. We thank you for the blessings you've put on our families. Lord, we specifically thank you that you have allowed us to be born in America, Lord God. You've allowed us to be in the land of the, of the free, Lord. We, we treasure that, Lord God. It's one of the reasons why we see, seem so upset when we see that trying to be taken away. But Lord, you are still God over this country. And I just thank you tonight for the families that are here. Bless them, Lord, in everything we do, Lord God, from the smallest problem to the largest, that they're all relative in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. That's... Revelation chapter 9. So, any questions before we leave tonight? But, but, uh, on that uh, thing where you said this little uh, block over there on Ryan's said second death, and that doesn't apply to people. No, second death, on, he's asking about the second death. The second death is, we're going to get to that. That's the, uh, that's the great white throne judgment where people are, where, are actually resurrected. The evil will have their bodies resurrected from the grounds and they will go into the lake of fire bodily and spirit wise their spirits once they die once the wicked dies their spirit goes to hell their bodies stay in the ground once we die our spirits go to heaven our bodies stay in the ground the first resurrection is when the rapture happens the bot the dead in christ will rise first those dead bodies will rise up and meet their bodies in the air first thessalonians then we who are alive and remain will be caught up the second death happens after the thousand year millennium when the wicked dead's bodies will actually resurrect and meet their spirits in hell Right. Well, the second death is spiritual death. It's not physical death. <coughs> Anybody else? What's the guy? 200,000? 200 million man militia. Would some of those be believers? Uh, no. No, it would be kings of the east and they would not be believers. So they'd already be gone. That's correct. That's, right. That's correct. Yes. Anybody else? How many are getting it? How many are getting to get it? All right. Thank you. We'll see you. Hey, by the way, one other thing. Thank you. Uh, we have two Mondays scheduled that we're going to be here. Uh, we are not going to be here those two Mondays. There's going to have no study those two Mondays. Next week, I believe we will be here uh, Wednesday. Is that correct, Brian? 
next week and then the week after it? Yeah, July 11th and 18th, there'll be no study on Mondays or Wednesday. We're giving you, we're giving you a summer break, and so I have to be other places, but, uh, but then we'll resume it on Wednesday. So we, we'll be all Wednesdays, so you know that. Thank you again. God bless you.